Ooh, okay. Greetings, fellow Kerbonauts. Welcome to Kerbal Space Program. My name is Rice. I am a KSP minimalist, and this is the Minimalist Shuttle Program. Or rather, a tutorial on how to create your own Minimalist Shuttle Program. Um, I've received a lot of requests uh, through a number of people um, who have watched uh, my Kerbal Space Program series either on Twitch or on the YouTube series. And they were always interested on how exactly do we design space shuttles. And not just that, not just designing space shuttles, but launching space shuttles the traditional way. And if you've ever attempted to build a space shuttle, um, say, like I have, <laughs> there's a bit of a trial and error involved. Actually, the easy part is designing the shuttle itself. However, the hard part is sending the actual shuttle into space. And what we're going to be doing is, believe it or not, um, and you could probably see based on the frame rates that you're seeing right now, is I am playing Kerbal Space Program on a fairly mid-range computer. This isn't, this isn't some sort of i7, um, several 4 plus, 4.0 plus gigahertz uh, computer. This is just a standard everyday office type computer that we're playing this game on. And so um, with that in mind, we are designing this under the minimalist concept. Functionality and design is what it's all about. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be designing a space shuttle that is uh, fairly about maybe 24 to 25 parts. And then we are going to take that space shuttle and we are going to launch it into orbit traditional style. Now what I mean traditional style is that you're going to have your basic fuel tank. Um, complete with your side solid rocket boosters and aside from the B9 pack almost all of it is going to be stock and when I say almost all of it is going to be stock <laughs> most likely it's just going to be the um, the actual launch vehicle itself the shuttle itself won't have a whole lot of stock parts to it because well you know it's B9 so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, you're going to need your cockpit. And so we're going to be using the S2 reusable pod. Now what's awesome about the S2 reusable pod is it helps you with part counts because it already has its own built-in RCS thrusters, which makes it really cool. So you don't really have to worry about that. I know that the new 23.5 update, which is what we're playing on right now, has uh, parts that inherently have RCS already in it. Like if we take a look at this pod here, you see that this landing tin can pod has already 40 units of monopropellant on it. Um, the B9 pack is updated as of October. <laughs> so the B9 pack is a fairly old pack. And so there's some bugs we're going to have to compensate for. And I believe the creator of the B9 pack said he won't be updating until point two four comes out. So it's going to be a little while. So until then, um, we're just going to have to mess around with this guy here. Okay, so now that we've got our, um, our cockpit here, next step, what we're going to be doing is, uh, I imagine we want a space shuttle that can carry more than two people, right? The regular NASA space shuttle usually carries about six people. So we are going to add in a crew pod. Look at that, look at that, we are adding in a crew pod, and the crew pod adds about 0.72 tons to the vehicle. Now, we have a space shuttle that can carry an amazing four Kerbonauts into space. All right, so now we have a uh, shuttle that's able to carry a crew back and forth between, uh, between the station and um, the planet itself. Next up, um, we're going to start expanding this vehicle. Now, this, at this point, this is where you can make your decision. Are we going to make a shuttle that's going to carry 1.25 meter parts into space? Or are we going to design a shuttle that's going to carry 2.5 meter parts into space? These are 1.5 meter parts. These guys right here. Um, and these are probably the first type of parts that ever came in with Kerbal Space Program during its earlier state in design. And these are the 2.5 meter parts. So ultimately, um, the first shuttle I ever designed usually carries 2.5 meter parts into space. So once you make your decision, you gotta figure out what type of cargo bay you're going to use. Okay, so um, if we were going to design a standard shuttle that's effectively streamlined, we would use this guy here. And this cargo pod right here carries you know, 1.5 meter parts into space. It's 
it's pretty usable, you know, and as you can see, if I grab a 1.25 meter part here, like right here, and I just kind of sort of snap it on here, well, you can see it just kind of fits, sort of, <laughs> into the bay. Uh, I'm not going to go through the hassle of, uh, of actually trying to put it in there, but uh, as you can see, this cargo bay can take it. However, um, if we're going to design a space shuttle that's going to launch the first part of a space station into space we are going to have to use bigger cargo bays so we're going to use this guy this amazing eight meter part cargo bay now as you can see doesn't exactly fit right <laughs> not too flush so we're gonna have to put in uh, another part into here so this cargo bay what this is is uh, in order to launch 1.25 meter parts into space you have to use a cargo bay that um, that is 2.5 meters, like this guy. In order to launch 2.5 meter parts into space, you have to use this monster cargo bay that is 3.75 meters. Um, so things scale up pretty big as your ambition does when trying to launch stuff into space. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in this reaction wheel here. And what this reaction wheel affords us is it provides us stability when we're launching our space shuttle into space. Um, so we're going to use this guy. Now, as you can see, it's not really too flush. Um, however, we can go into and use our adapter here to make it a little bit more flush and then add in our, uh, <laughs> add in our reaction wheel. Uh, however, remember, we are shooting for functionality and elegant design, which means we're not going to add in too many parts that, uh, re that really don't add to the design itself, right? The general rule of thumb for engineering, for all of you engineering majors out there is, you know, if you build your thing in such a way where you can't take anything more away from it, then you have built an elegant vehicle. And that's what we're aiming for here. So we're just going to plop this uh, reaction wheel onto the space shuttle and then reattach, whoops, and reattach our cargo bay to the shuttle. There we go. Now, as you can see, the body's starting to come together. Next up, we need a fuel tank. Okay, so this space shuttle is not going to, um, is not going to maneuver uh, around Kerbin using regular propellant fuel. It is going to use monopropellant fuel straight out. Now, what this does for us is it helps us conserve weight and it helps us conserve part count. Um, it's similar to how Scott Manley does it when he builds his shuttles. His original shuttle designs don't use um, any liquid fuel whatsoever once they get into orbit. They use monopropellant and that's pretty much what we're going to be doing too. So we have our monopropellant tank, we smack it on the end there, and now we have a fairly, um, a fairly completed main body for our shuttle design. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this puppy. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and name it. We're going to call it, um, hmm, Minimalist Shuttle of Awesome Mitude. There we go, we're gonna use some technical wording there. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So, next up, uh, we're going to go ahead and plop our landing gears. Now, first instinct for a lot of people who are playing around with the B9 uh, pack is that they want to uh, is that they have a tendency to use these landing gears that come with the pack, and they're pretty cool. They're neat. However, keep in mind that these landing gears were designed way back in October, which means um, they use the old physics models, the old Unity 4 engine type design that Kerbal Space Program um, used to run on. Um, and as a result, these uh, these um, landing gears aren't really updated for Kerbal's, for the current Kerbal Space Program um, update, which means um, if you, you, as they are right now, they work perfectly fine. Um, however, you only notice the shortcomings of the landing gear when you design really large craft. And you'll start to really notice it too, because if you attach these large um, landing gears onto your craft, they'll start to bow and flex and twist a little bit. Um, and I imagine that's because they're not properly designed for the current update. But um, what you want to focus on is using the regular landing gears that came with the stock pack. These 
are, are designed for the current update of Kerbal Space Program. They're sturdy, they don't bow and flex, and plus they have some additional functionality, all the awesome lights and all that fun stuff. So let's go ahead and plop this guy here right in the back of the vehicle. Okay, and there we are. Now the downside um, to using the stock landing gears is these landing gears weigh 0.5 tons, right? Um, if you look at these statistics here. If we go to the B9 landing gears, they weigh 0 0.09 tons, 0.11 tons. Every single one of these landing gears are several factors lighter <laughs> than the stock landing gears. So that's the sacrifice you need to make for elegance of design and functionality of design when you're using these stock landing gears. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and disable the brakes on the front landing gear here too, because when we brake our space shuttle, we don't want it to fly end over end. Okay, so here we go. Um, we've got the bulk of uh, our design set and ready to go. Next up, we're going to start um, putting together our wings and lifting. Okay, so uh, we're going to do is we're going to use a Delta Wing model for our space shuttle. Keep in mind, um, the space shuttle itself uh, uses a lifting body type mechanic, which means that the main body of the space shuttle provides lift in addition to the wings. Unfortunately, the lifting model in Kerbal Space Program, the aerodynamics model, isn't really designed that way, and that all the lift comes specifically from wings, not from the body of the vehicle itself. Unless, of course, you decide to um, install the Ferrum Aerospace mod, which allows lifting bodies. Um, really cool mod, by the way, but we're not going to mess around with that one. We are going to stick with our old traditional um, stock model here, um, and we're going to use the, uh, the regular um, aerodynamic design that this game came with. Okay, so we're going to use um, these um, delta wings. Now watch out for these delta wings here. Take a look at the lift rating. The lift rating is 2.69. Um, as far as lift rating goes, uh, this lift rating is amazing when compared to stock wings, <laughs> right? The lift rating here is 2.69. If, if we scoot on over to the best lift rating on the best stock wing in the game, um, that's this guy, the Delta wing, which has a 1.9. However, this wing has one of the worst lift ratings in the B9 aerospace pack. Originally, when I started designing uh, shuttles in this game. I use this wing here, which has the second highest lift rating in the B9 aerospace pack, 6.53. Um, however, um, if you look at it, let's scooch back here. If we were to take this wing off, excuse me, and uh, put the wing here, it looks kind of ugly, right? There's not exactly a delta wing design. We're not very shuttle-like. So, um, and plus, um, these wings are slightly overpowered. <laughs> <laughs> Take note, guys. B9 pack items can be overpowered sometimes. Um, so these Delta Wings provide a little bit more of a challenge. And plus, it makes it look more shuttle-like, which is super cool. Okay. So um, what we're going to do next is we are going to add in our ailerons. Not, not our ailerons. Our canards. Um, curious thing about uh, the aer aerodynamic model of this game is that the canard, the uh, um, the, con the control surfaces of the game are designed in such a way where um, the most efficient way to control a craft is with canards, not so much not so much the back end of the craft, uh, like these um, um, these flaps that I put in the back end. They do okay. However, um, when you take a look at the I'm going to go ahead and turn on the center of mass versus center of lift. Most of the mass is going to be toward the front of the shuttle. And so these uh, flaps are going to have a hard time lifting the nose up. And so that's what these canards are going to be for, is to allow the shuttle to lift its nose up when you ultimately glide back down. Um, if you don't use you know, these canards, which you can't, you don't have to, but it'll make it a lot easier for you. Uh, what'll happen is you're just gonna have to punch your finger down on the S key as you fight to try to lift your nose up as it returns into the atmosphere. And that can be a little bit tough sometimes. Okay, so next up we're going to need some um, lateral stability. 
So the lateral stability function we're going to throw onto the side here. Okay, let's see. Okay, and we're gonna put this off to the side of the wing. Right about there, there we go. Okay, so these are the stock wings that we're going to be using um, for lateral stability. And sometimes you only need just one. Um, you really don't need a whole lot of lateral stability in Kerbal Space Program, but you know, might as well double down to make it look nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our Minimalist Shuttle of Awesomitude and see how many parts we have so far. We have 16 parts. Pretty respectable, right? <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and check our thrust to weight. And our thrust to weight. Our lift versus center of mass. Our center of mass is a little bit forward of our center of lift. That's okay as it is, but check this out. Um, as we use our monopropellant, it's going to move. It's going to move further and further and further away from our um, center of lift. And as it moves further and further and further away, the more our space shuttle becomes like a lawn dart and makes it difficult for us to lift our nose. So we need to move our wings a little bit forward here so that our center of lift is a little closer toward our center of mass. So let's scooch it a little bit forward here. Actually, we can probably put it almost smack dab in the center. Like so. There we go. And now let's go ahead and check our monopropellant weight. And if we theoretically come back to the planet with maybe one quarter of our monopropellant, that is respectable right there. That makes it pretty darn controllable. Now, this puts us into a commitment when we launch our shuttle. And our commitment is that we have to use our monopropellant fuel when we come back to Kerbin. Because if we don't use our monopropellant fuel at all, which I can't see how we would not, <laughs> this, this center of mass right smack dab in the middle of the center of lift means that the vehicle is going to be hard to control because it's going to be, it's going to flip end over end real easy as it enters the atmosphere. So that's something to watch out for. So we're going to go ahead and add on our RCS thrusters. So we're going to add in four RCS thrusters, two on the wings two on the back end of the vehicle. Okay. There we are. And we're gonna save this buddy here. Okay. Now that we've done that, now we all we have to do is we gotta start testing the vehicle's glide ability. So let's go ahead and add on a decoupler. And we're going to add in just a regular old thruster and or booster. Here we go, we're just gonna add in a fuel tank here. And we're going to add in an engine. Okay, here we are. We are going to attempt to launch this vehicle so we can test to see how it glides first. And we're going to add in a um, action group that'll open and close the cargo bay because eh, pretty important to fly around with a closed cargo bay, right? <laughs> okay. Here we go, so let's go ahead and launch this bad boy and let's see if we can um, we can get this thing to properly glide. Okay. All right, uh, waiting for this thing to load here. A nice lazy Sunday. Okay, so let's go ahead and close that cargo bay. And we're going to uh, throttle up and now, let's go ahead and launch. Okay, we're at full thrust here. Let's go ahead and lift our wings. Just, oh boy, here we go, here we go. Ah! <laughs> oh, 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 we're still doing good. We're still doing good. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing up to 500 meters. Come on, 500 meters, 600 meters. Good enough. Release the booster, and let's prep for gliding. Oh my gosh, we are gliding the wrong direction. Uh, uh, uh. There we go, lights on. And let's see if we can hit the ground before we, uh, we smack into the ocean. Come on, baby. Come on. Okay. <laughs> Not so awesome there. 
Um, also, uh, we forgot to add in electricity uh, to this vehicle. This vehicle has no way to produce electricity. So let's go and head on back here and let's, uh, let's change, let's uh, do a quick modification to the design here. Testing and doing stuff. <laughs> Um, let me see here. I'm reading the comments because it kept giving me an error. Live the launcher. Yeah, the, the launcher is the hardest. I'm going to show you guys how to build a proper launcher for this vehicle so that you can launch this shuttle traditional style. Um, yeah, absolutely, guys. Please ask questions. Um, ask as many questions as you like. I'd be super happy to answer them. Uh, keep in mind, though, that there is something like a 45-second delay, 30-second delay in this live stream. Um, something about YouTube servers not being completely, uh, not being as, well, also has something to do with my upload rate, too. But please, ask questions. Just keep in mind that uh, there's going to be a little bit of a delay in me answering them, you know. So this is completely an open forum thing just for all of us to have fun, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and add on a radial thermal generator. We need a way for this vehicle to produce electricity. So um, we're going to add a radial thermal generator about here, which is awesome. Now, be mindful. Radial thermal generators, these generators, they don't produce a whole lot of electricity at any given time. Um, oh, well, hi there, freak. 80MC. <laughs> okay, these radio thermal generators, they don't produce a whole lot of electricity. Um, and so it'll drain the energy from the shuttle rather quickly. And where most of the energy drain is coming from is that is that B9 aerospace reaction wheel. Because that reaction wheel produces 125 torque, which is crazy. It's like overpowered torque. Um, and so if you're not careful and you start moving your shuttle around way too much, you're going to drain all your battery power all at once. So you got to be real careful about that. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to test the glide. Let's go ahead and uh, um, head on back out there again. Uh, we need to be able to properly land this shuttle before we can attach... Um, before we can attach the lifting, um, the, the, um, the solid rocket boosters and the fuel tank to this thing. So we need to make sure that this shuttle is properly set up and ready so that it can come back to Kerbin without uh, exploding. <laughs> as much as we love explosions in this game, I'm pretty sure Jeb and Bill love to live and not to die. Okay, so we're going to be a little bit more careful about this one this time. And boost up. And here we go. Oh yeah, you're right. I forgot to drain the RCS for, from the uh, from the fuel, um, the RCS from the tank to uh, test out to see how the. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Um, so this is kind of a moot point then. What I'm doing here, <laughs> but ironically, we are flying. Look at that. Look at that glide. Okay. Um, as you can see, our electrical power is draining rather heftily. Um, and we... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There we go. <laughs> Almost a pinpoint landing. All right. Let's go and head back to uh, the uh, aerospace hangar again. And let's go ahead and drain out the RCS fuel. Um, we're going to drain the RCS fuel down to about a quarter um, of a tank, and we're going to test to see the, the stability of landing with three quarters of its RCS fuel gone. Okay, so we're going to drop this thing down. We'll bring it down to about 136 units of, of monopropellant fuel. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and head back out again. Okay, and let's go ahead and see if we can fly this sucker. Okay. 
Um, in order to make this one work, however, guys, I'm going to have to ask for your early forgiveness. <laughs> because as much as I love crashing this thing, we really need to get this testing thing out of the way. So what we are going to do is, bum bum bum, we are going to cheat. We're going to hack lay gravity. Okay. And this will help us um, test out this vehicle. So we're going to activate the booster and we're going to tilt ourselves slightly up give ourselves a little bit of a boost and then what we're going to do is that once we reach about oh 800 meters um that's when we'll go ahead and reactivate gravity again and then we will go ahead and test the glideability of this vehicle okay what's interesting about this is that even though the gravity is turned off the atmosphere is still on, so there's still hefty lifting happening with these wings here, which is going to make this design a little bit unstable as we try to get this thing up there. Um, but that's okay, because we have cheating on our side, right? <laughs> okay, so let's... Ooh, ooh, oh, 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 let's go and turn off that thruster. Let's check to see what our weight is. We are at 20 tons. That's with our, um, that's with the fuel tank attached though. So let's disengage the fuel tank. And now our real weight is 12.12 .12 tons. So we are looking pretty good actually. All right, so let's orient ourselves properly before we begin landing. Okay, and, 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 there we go. Okay, next up we are going to activate gravity. Okay, guys, fingers crossed. Here we go. Unhack gravity. And as you can see, we're starting to dip down a little bit here. We are moving at 35, 36. So we're still stalling a little bit. We need to get this thing roughly about 45 meters per second to prevent us from stalling. And we're going to turn the brakes on here too. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Come on, buddy. You can do it. Okay, ultimately what we're doing is that when we, um, as we glide back down, we want to try to get that, uh, our vertical speed down to somewhere around minus 5 meters per second. Right now we are about minus 8 meters per second, uh, which is okay. Um, however, we're probably going to squash something um, on the trip down. So we got to be real careful about that. Um, so we need to flare up a little bit here. Okay. And um, we're still doing pretty good, actually. Um, oh, boy. Let's dip our nose down a little bit. And you know what? I just realized we have the wrong ailerons on this vehicle. Oh, boy. We're going to have to replace the ailerons when we get back. So let's lift our vehicle, and we're going to flare up. We need to drop this below 5 meters per second. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Woo! As you can see, our electricity is almost gone, too. Um, I wasn't kidding when I said those reaction wheels drain electricity like a boss. So you got to be careful about that. Oh my gosh. Oh, hold it steady. Okay. There we go. And slowing ourselves down. And, and, and 22 meters per second. Here we go. Here we go. 15 meters per second, and other than that little stumble that we had uh, landing ourselves down, um, it was actually pretty decent. We did pretty good. Uh, not bad for using the wrong ailerons, right? <laughs> okay, let's go and head back over to a space plane hangar, and we need to replace those ailerons. Um, we're going to be using um, the proper ailerons that will allow us better control. Oh. If you guys have messed around a lot with the uh, with the B9 pack and say you were messing around with the Ferrum Aerospace mod, you will have noticed that uh, these ailerons that I currently have attached to the shuttle don't work very well. Um, as a matter of fact, they, they provide lift, but they don't provide lifting control. Um, and that has something to do with uh, a bug with the uh, with uh, a bug in the compatibility between the B9 pack and the rest of the game itself. Uh, so we're going to get rid of that, and we're going to add on these ailerons here. There we go. These provide better lift. Okay, and out there, good. 
These also provide better control. A whole lot better control. Okay, and let's go ahead and check to see where our center of mass versus our center of lift lies. Okay, so um, we're looking pretty good. Let's see what it would be like if we were to fill up the tank completely. Okay, so we need to bring our wings a little bit back here. And we're going to put it roughly about dead center. So if we were to test again, um, once our monopropellant was drained, we're still looking pretty good. Okay, we can keep this shuttle as it is. And I am fairly comfortable that this thing can glide back to Kerbin. Um, look at that tubby shuttle that could. <laughs> I know, right? This is one fat looking shuttle. Um, however, if we're going to bring up uh, space station modules uh, like the like the infamous uh, Kerbal Crew Can, um, we need a bay big enough to be able to fit that shuttle. When, if we're going to bring up one of these guys up there. Okay. So, we are good to go. I'm going to assume everything is awesome. Um, and you know about assuming. Assuming makes an ass out of you and me, right? <laughs> but uh, in the Kerbal world, we can be forgiven for assuming. Okay, so let's go ahead and close up our landing gears. And now we get into the lifting portion. Uh, first off, let's go ahead and light up our cargo bay. We need a light inside that cargo bay. So we're going to put in a Mark II illuminator, uh, roughly about there. Okay, and let's check to see if the light can illuminate a good chunk of the bay. Looking good. Um, let's bring it down just a little bit, and perfecto! Okay. All right, so... Um, now that we got that all squared away, it's time to get the lifting body squared away. All right, so once upon a time, uh, when I started, uh, when, when I decided designing shuttles for this game and whatnot, I decided upon the idea of using the KW Rocketry Pack. I don't use the KW Rocketry Pack anymore because 23.5 update provides us with these amazing new 3.75 parts. These guys right here. Um, the KW Rocketry Pack, I used to use the 3.75 parts off of that to design the shuttle. Um, um, and now I can play this game with one less mod. Woo! Okay, so let's go ahead and add on. What we're going to do next is we're going to add on Lay Fuel Tank. Um, so we need, first off, we're going to add on the decoupler. We're going to put in a radial decoupler. Just your good old-fashioned, everyday radial decoupler here. And we're going to attach it to the bottom, like right about there. Okay. Well, there it is. Now, before I continue, keep in mind there's two routes you can go when you're designing a shuttle. Um, in terms of its lifting components. You can do the traditional way, which is one fuel tank and, and with SRBs to the side. Or, or you can do it the easier way, which involves something like this. Attaching radial decouplers to the sides of the wings, like this. And then attaching smaller fuel tanks to the sides, like this. Okay. You can do that. Um, and that's a perfectly fine way to go. Um, it keeps things nice and stable, and it's easier to lift it into orbit. However, we are doing this pro style. So we are not taking the easy route. We are going to do this. Um, we're going to do this hard mode. So we're going to do this the standard shuttle way, and we're going to put one big main fuel tank on the bottom here. Okay. So here we go. We are now entering the realm where we have asymmetric design, where the center of mass is off of the rest of its bulk, and it's going to uh, it's going to offset our center of thrust and all that fun stuff and things are going to go haywire and flop around like crazy. But there's a way to uh, to be able to compensate for that and you'll see in just a moment. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide some stability control with this fuel tank. So we're going to plop on some more reaction wheels. Now the regular shuttle um, the real life shuttle, I keep saying the regular shuttle, but <laughs> the real life shuttle has, uh, has uh, what it does to counteract its asymmetric design during liftoff is it has its engine bells. Um, its engine bells are able to rotate around something like plus or 18, uh, 18 to 20 degrees. 
which is really cool. Um, you, know, you see those engine bells start to move around like crazy. However, um, the engines in this game, they have a vectoring range of, as you can see here, one degree. Just one tiny degree, which is definitely not enough to counteract um, the off-centered weight when you're flying your shuttle. So in order to, count, to uh, help compensate for that, we are using these reaction wheels to help keep the shuttle stabilized during a flight. Okay? All right, so we're going to stabilize uh, the shuttle attachment to the, uh, the fuel tank. So let me go ahead and add in one single strut here. Um, you don't need a ton of struts. These struts are actually pretty powerful. Um, and in the interest of maintaining minimalist design, don't go too crazy with the struts. <laughs> okay, there we go. And we have our struts attached. Next up, we're going to attach the shuttle engines. So um, we're going to attach our decoupler here. And I'm gonna add a decoupler to the back, just like that. Uh, next up, we are going to attach our vectoring thrusters. Now remember what I said? Uh, when I mentioned that, uh, um, remember what I said when I mentioned that the, uh, oh boy, brain fart, that the, re the real life shuttle has the ability to vector its engines, right? 18, 20 degrees. Um, we are going to be simulating that using these amazing VTOL engines, okay? So we're gonna attach the VTOL engines to the sides here of our um, decoupler. So let's get that squared away. We're gonna attach them one at a time to our decoupler. First off, let's make sure we got the right engine. So we're going to be using our VA1 VTOL engine. So let's go ahead and attach that. Okay. And ooh, we're going to attach it one at a time. Now, I could easily um, put this on symmetrically and add both at the same time. However, um, there's a curious bug with the B9 pack. Um, and as you vector the engines, sometimes these engines don't vector in the same direction. Sometimes these engines vector contradictory to each other. And that's, uh, and that's the fault with uh, trying to add in, uh, turning on uh, the symmetry mode when you add on these thrusters. Um, and also it's one of those bugs that I hope will be addressed in the next B9 pack update. So let's go ahead and add this on. We're gonna add this one at a time. So one vectoring thruster and two vectoring thrusters. Cross your fingers. We're gonna try to add this on as symmetrical as possible without using symmetry mode. <laughs> now what this does for us is it allows us to customize each end of it, each engine individually, okay? That way um, we can use these individual vectoring engines to counteract the thrust accordingly as the vehicle is going into flight. Okay, and uh, Freak ADMC, I'll see you later. Take care, buddy. Hopefully we'll see you later. Okay, and let's go ahead and next up, we're going to customize these vectoring engines and we're gonna provide some control. So what we're going to do is, uh, first off, um, we're going to come and go into this VTOL menu right here. In this VTOL menu, we're gonna customize a few things. This is the step, we're gonna change the step size option. And what the step size is, 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 <laughs> is how many degrees will the engines tilt every single time you tilt your engines? Wow, that's a bit of a uh, double negative there, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going to change this to 10 degrees. So the engines are going to increment at 10 degrees at a time. Okay, there we go. And we're gonna do that for both of these engines. So just to double check, 10 degrees, 10 degrees. Perfect all. All right. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to assign action groups to these amazing engines. Okay. So um, when I press two, I want these engines to raise. Oops. Okay, and this engine will raise. Okay, and then if when I press three, I want the engines to pitch down. 
and pitch down. Perfecto. Okay. So now we've got our action groups assigned. These are going to be our vectoring engines that'll keep the space shuttle level as we lift off into the cosmos. Okay. All right. So next up, we are going to need our main lifting engine. This is going to be the one that we can't. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to be the engine that we can't um, vector um, during flight. <laughs> So we have to be very careful and be very deliberate about where, how we're going to pitch this engine. So we're going to put it about here. I'm going to put in uh, one of these girders, and we're going to tilt it, I think, five. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay, and then we're going to add in our engine. We're going to attach one of these bad boys here, the Rocco Max mainsail liquid engine. There we go. And there we have it. So next step, what we want to do is we want for we want to be able to feed fuel to these engines. As is right now, um, decouplers don't have fuel cross feed capability, and that's on purpose, <laughs> so that when you stage your rockets, um, they don't end up using fuel from other fuel tanks that were meant for other stages. So we need to feed fuel directly from this tank over to all three of these engines. So we're gonna attach uh, one of these fuel lines here. And then we're gonna attach it to the bottom of the decoupler, just like that. Piece of cake, right? And then um, you don't really need it, but for the sake of stability, we're gonna add in another strut here. So we're going to add in a strut from this engine. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, and attach it to that engine there. Um, what has what has what's what a tendency what has what usually happens? Oh boy, stumbling over myself today, is that when you have an engine with a ton of thrust and there isn't proper um, and isn't properly attached to your vehicle, it has a tendency to wobble around during flight. Um, and really, you don't want your shuttle to shake and shimmy as it's lifting off into space, right? So that strut keeps the keeps that engine nice and stable. Okay. Next up, what we are going to do is um, we are going to attach our SRBs, SRBs, SRBs. Okay. Remember, we're playing this hard mode, so we're doing this the regular shuttle style. <laughs> so here are, our, here are our radial decouplers that we attach to the side. And we are going to be using the brand new SRBs that came with the 23.5 update. And that means these guys right here, these SRB engines. Um, we're gonna toggle off the flag here. Now, once we add these on, um, as you can see, as it is right now, it already looks like a standard shuttle, right? With a standard lifting bottle. Yeah, that's awesome. Woo, we are almost there, guys. Um, unfortunately, though, the way that these SRBs are designed, as awesome as they are, and though they provide an amazing 650 units of thrust believe it or not these are still too underpowered for our shuttle design so what we have to do is we have to add on another set of srbs <laughs> so here we go when in doubt in the kerbal universe add more rockets right okay so let's see if we can make this as symmetrical as possible there we go all right, so now we have four SRBs attached to this thing. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're going to properly stage them. So we're gonna put these SRBs with the rest of our engines. When we lift off, every single engine needs to fire and do their part. Okay, what we're going to do next is we need to attach some separatrons to these um, engines, uh, to our um, SRBs. Keep in mind, uh, that uh, the way the um, the shuttle lifts off is it doesn't lift off in a straight vertical line. Um, the shuttle has a tendency to move laterally as it's flying through the air. And so when it moves laterally here in Kerbal Space Program and it releases these SRBs, these SRBs are going to be moving opposite of the direction of that lateral movement. What that means in layman's terms is that once you detach these SRBs, they're going to fly right for your wings and shear them off. <laughs> so 
So you want to add on these separatrons to help prevent that. Um, and so you want to push these SRBs away from the shuttle um, after you detach them. So let's go and add these here. And we're going to add uh, some other separatrons about roughly... This is a little bit of a challenge because you're guesstimating what the center of mass for these SRBs are going to be after um, after they are drained of fuel. Okay, and let's see here. There we go. And almost there. Perfect. Okay, let's go and test this and take a look at the symmetry of this thing. Okay. So these, these separatrons are a little bit under. Let's fix that just a little bit there. There we go. Okay. So SRBs are ready to go almost. Next up, what we do is, well, actually, we need to properly stage these. So we want to put these separatrons with the decouplers. So let's go ahead and move these guys over with the decouplers. Okay. And now we need to make sure that these SRBs are stable. So let's go ahead and add on some struts. Struts. Some. Um, the technical term is space tape, I believe, in the Kerbal Space Program community. <laughs> okay, there we go. And now we have some stability. Perfecto. All right. Next up, we need to add on, add on our amazing launch clamps. So let's go ahead and attach our launch clamps here. Um, let's see, so we've got... Now, placement of the launch clamps is super important because you never, ever, 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 ever want to add your launch clamps to the side like this, right? Um, when you launch your shuttle, because um, you... Uh, something like that. Now, remember when I said that uh, as the shuttle lifts off, it's going to have some lateral movement? Well, what's going to happen is that when this shuttle takes off, these clamps, uh, the shuttle is going to be moving left toward the launch clamps. And these launch clamps, if you're not careful, will run into these wings and will, again, shear off those wings. So... Um, you don't want to put the launch clamps there up against the solid rocket boosters. What you want to do, actually, is take these launch clamps and you want to put them underneath the shuttle, like right about here. So let's go ahead and attach these guys here. And we'll add on another set of launch clamps that will support the shuttle. Um, roughly, let's say... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nice and steady. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit of a challenge here. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to attach that. And then... Whew, um, hmm. That's not going to work. Um, there we go. Nope, that's not going to work either. Let's... <sighs> needs to be some sort of connection to the shuttle here. Let's actually attach them to the side of our no that's not gonna work either hmm um actually ooh, i think we might have found something let's attach them here perfecto okay so let's add these launch clamps and properly stage them there we go okay we are looking good, you guys. Look at that. We are just spiffy. All right. So um, next up, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to test this bad boy. It is time to test our minimalist shuttle of awesomitude. So let's go ahead and we're going to turn the shuttle around. And when you launch your shuttle, this is about the right orientation you want to set your shuttle at. Okay. And what this does is um, it allows you the capability to move um, your shuttle in such a way where as you take off, um, you can tilt your shuttle 45 degrees in the proper direction much more easily. Now you notice the, uh, the engines are clipping down underneath uh, the asphalt. Um, don't worry about that. When you click the launch button, the, the game compensates for that. Okay? So here we go. Let's head on to the launch pad.
Alrighty, and we are loading. We are loading. Okay, so first thing is first. Let's check to see if the infamous B9, um, the B9 aerospace pack bug is there. So I'm gonna press the two and three keys and watch these engines underneath here. See if they vector identically in the same direction. Uh, nope, there's that bug, you guys. You notice if you look down at the bottom there, you see how the engines are are not tilting in the same direction. They're tilting opposite each other. And that is not what you want in a shuttle design. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't want your shuttle spinning around as it takes off. Okay, so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to go back into the space plane hangar and just do a little bit of a tweak. <laughs> Okay, here we go. And, 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 um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna load up our minimalist shuttle of awesomitude. Okay, and we're going to have to tweak those thrusters. Let's see here. So, let's go ahead and open up our action groups. Okay, for one of these, um, we're gonna take this VTOL thruster. Um, instead of raising the engine, this is gonna seem really derpy, and um, but um, for the sake of compensating for the uh, <laughs> the bug that the B9 pack has, we're gonna do we're gonna say two will lower that engine, um, and then three will raise that engine. Okay. There we go. That should fix that error. Fingers crossed, guys. Let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can properly move uh, vector those engines accordingly. Okay, let's head back into the launch pad again, and let's see what we got. Okay, and loading, 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 loading. All right, so we are back on the runway. Okay, all right, keep your eyeballs square on those um, on those boosters, on these thrusters here. Oh, 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 I think we've hit the jackpot, guys. Oh, look at that, that is beautiful, look at that! Oh, it's just the little things in life that, uh, <laughs> the little things in life that truly make it amazing, right? The boosters are now moving properly um, and they are moving in the right direction. Okay, spiffy. Now let's go ahead and close our um, cargo bay. Let's go ahead and turn on our cockpit lights. We're gonna turn on our resource indicator so that we can keep track of everything, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're gonna activate all of our indicators too. There we go. All right, guys. This is our make or break moment with our shuttle. Um, and we're gonna rename this guy too. We're gonna call it the, um, we're gonna call it the Jeb's Awesome Shuttle. <laughs> okay, that's a technical term, guys. All right, here we go. So before we launch, we are going to tilt our uh, vectoring thrusters accordingly. So we're gonna vector it the opposite direction. We're gonna tilt it about 30 degrees in the opposite direction, okay? Why are we tilting our vectoring thrusters in this direction? Well, the reason why um, is because these SRVs are going to counter against um, against the lift that's happening from these engines here. Each of these SRBs have 650 units of thrust. So multiply that times four, and uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm not incredibly awesome at last second math, but that's a poop load of thrust. And that's a lot more than these thrusters can provide. So what'll happen is if you don't vector these thrusters before launch, these SRBs are gonna overpower the center of mass and the shuttle is gonna flip and whoop, it's gonna flip N over N on its backside. Okay, guys, fingers crossed. We're gonna try to launch this sucker. Here we go in five, four, three, two, 
One and launch. Here we go. Woo. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to vector our thrusters. And we're going to tilt it 20 degrees, 10 degrees. And we're going to tilt to zero degrees. Okay. So now the, thru now the vectoring thrusters are up and down. As we launch, take a look at the left-hand side. Keep your eyeballs on the pitch indicator that, that um, over here on the bottom left corner. Okay, that's very important as you're launching because what that is is the pitch indicator indicates how much work your um, your inline reaction wheels are working to try to keep the shuttle stable during flight. Remember, this is an asymmetric design, right? So the center of mass is way off. The direction of thrust is way off. So that's something you need to be careful of. So we're tilting our thruster back 10 degrees. Now watch this pitch indicator. You're going to see this pitch indicator start to dip the further we go up. Now the reason why this pitch indicator is dipping is slowly going down toward the bottom is because the SRVs are running out of fuel. The main tank is running out of fuel. And as we start to run out of fuel, the center of mass starts to change. In order to counter that, you want to move your vectoring thruster. So watch this. I'm gonna hit the two key, bam! See that pitch indicator start to lift up? And now it's still under, so I'm gonna hit the two key again. Bam! And there it is. You notice these thrusters are now 20, tilted at 20 degrees, and they're countering the fact that our center of thrust is now off. Okay? So that's one thing you wanna be careful of. Because if you don't do that, eventually what's gonna happen is the pitch indicator is gonna go all the way down to the bottom, and then your shuttle uh, it is so heavy that your reaction wheels can't keep the shuttle stable anymore, and that's when you'll start to flip. Here we go. The SRBs are starting to, um, are almost done. So one thing you want to be careful of, as soon as SRBs are done, your shuttle is going to flip end over end, so you want to tilt your vectoring thrusters accordingly so it doesn't flip. So I am tilting my vectoring thrusters the opposite direction. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. And moment of truth. And we are going to get rid of these SRBs and three, two, one, go. Bye, SRBs. You're awesome. Thanks for uh, letting us borrow you. Oh, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> okay. And we are moving at roughly... Okay, you can see that our speed is dropping slightly. That's perfectly normal. That's okay. Um, as long as we're not dropping below 100 meters per second, we're still okay. All right. So now all the thrust is coming from that single Rocco Max engines and those two VTOL thrusters. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on. You can do it. Increase speed. All right. Our speed is starting to increase again. Thank goodness. So we're going to switch over to orbital speed. And we are at 241 meters per second. All right. So um, we're going to start tilting our shuttle. We have to start tilting our shuttle. Um, and we need to start doing our gravity turn to 45 degrees. So here we go. 45 degrees. Okay. Actually, we need to dip it more than 45 degrees. Keep your eyeball on that pitch indicator. You notice how that pitch indicator is now above? Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the 3 key. Watch what happens when I press the 3 key. 3 key. See the pitch indicator drop down? We need to drop it down more to center it. So, 3 key again. And there it is. Beautiful, isn't it? I love these VTOL thrusters. They can vector thrust, they can vector thrust like no one's business. Okay, so we're going to tilt our shuttle some more. We need um, to start making our, um, our suborbital trajectory look a little bit more flat. So we need to flatten that puppy out. So we're going to tilt ourselves down to 70 degrees. Okay, and we are moving at 450 meters per second. We are looking awesome, guys. Spiffy, and we still have a whole 5,000 units of thrust, so we're still looking pretty cool. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at our map here. And, okay, we're looking good, looking good. All right, um, hmm. Let's go ahead and tilt us up to 30 degrees. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go, 30 degrees. Okay, so our gravity turn is shout is going to steepen just a little bit. Okay. All right, guys. So um, you can call this a gravity turn. You can call this a centrifugal turn. Uh, technically, it's a centrifugal turn, not a gravity turn. But, you know, 
not splitting hairs there. <laughs> I prefer to call it gravity turn. Less syllables to use uh, when going, uh, less syllables to use. Okay, so we are approaching 800 meters per second. Our magic goal that we are attempting to reach is roughly 1300 meters per second. At 1300 meters per second, that's when we start hitting suborbital flight. Okay, so here we go. We are approaching one kilometer. We are almost there. Fingers crossed, you guys. Notice how that pitch indicator is dipping now. So I'm going to hit the two key to lift the pitch indicator up towards the center. Woo, there it is. Okay, and it's still dipping slightly. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're still good. Okay, cool. So um, we're going to dip our shuttle a little bit more. We are almost at suborbital flight. Um, we just need about 200 meters per second more of delta V, and we are good to go. Okay, and let's go and take a look at our map here. Ooh, ooh. Okay, we need to dip ourselves a lot more now. Um, our apoaps is at 85 kilometers. Okay. And, 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 and 90 kilometers. And we're going to hit Miko at 95. So three, two, one, Miko, main engine cutoff. Perfect. All right, we are looking beautiful. All right, so this at this point, here's what you got to decide for yourself. You can either keep this main engine on, um, and you can use it to stabilize your orbit around Kerbin, or you can turn off this main engine like I'm about to do here, shut down engine. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use these VTOL thrusters to stabilize our orbit. Um, the decision mainly comes from the cargo that you're carrying. If the cargo is way too heavy um, and you see that you're starting to run low on fuel, and right now we're looking pretty decent on fuel, you want to turn off your main engine and stick specifically to your VTOL engines. The reason being is because these VTOL engines have a specific impulse of 390, making them exceptionally fuel efficient in a vacuum. This guy here though has like a has a specific impulse of like 320, which is horrible, and you're going to lose fuel like no one's business. Okay? So let's go ahead and start up our engines, and as you can see, we're starting to dip. So I'm going to move vector our thrusters. Keep your eye on these vector on these thrusters here as I vector vector vector. Oh boy. All right. Rampant use of the word vector there. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Let's go and take a look here. All right, the reason why I'm starting my engines now is because we are only working on 200 kilonewtons of thrust combined with this stuff. And our current weight is um, 66 tons. And at 200 meters per second delta V, we're going to need um, as much leeway as possible to stabilize our orbit. If we were using our main Rockomax engine, we could stabilize our orbit almost at the apolapse and, stab and like stabilize our orbit in like less than 45 seconds, 30 seconds-ish. However, it's going to take us like a minute to two minutes to be able to stabilize this. Now, don't worry if your nose is pointed below the horizon because we are tilting our v VTOL thrusters anyway. So our direction of thrust is asymmetric from our nose. So just because our nose is tilted below the horizon, doesn't mean that our thrusters are pointing below the horizon. Um, that's one of those weird, <laughs> weird things you got to get used to when you're designing these shuttles. Okay, so let's take a look here. How are we looking? We're looking pretty awesome. Now, one thing, if you hadn't noticed yet, I am doing this entirely without maneuver nodes. Oh, I know, right? Um, maneuver nodes, they're awesome. They're great. Um, however, as you're flying a space shuttle, with asymmetric thrust and asymmetric mass, um, you'll discover that maneuver nodes won't do you too much. Won't do you too much help, um, and that's because um, when the maneuver node tells you to point your shuttle in a certain direction, um, and you start doing and you start thrusting, um, your asymmetric thrust is going to throw um, your shuttle completely off its course. So you got to be careful for that. Um, but overall, I'm just getting into orbit. You really don't need maneuver nodes, anyways. Okay. And we are 22 seconds, 21 seconds to apple apps. 
Okay, guys, looks like we're in a little bit of trouble here. We are at 1,500 meters per second, and we still haven't stabilized. Our goal is we want to hit about 2,200 meters per second. We're still way off of that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to activate our main thruster. I'm going to limit the throttle, however. We're going to put it at 13% and activate the thruster. And hopefully that will give us an extra boost of speed um, that will stabilize us. Okay, because with those V2L thrusters alone, there was no way we were going to be able to stabilize this orbit before we entered the atmosphere. So, here we go. Very careful. Now let's check our pitch indicator, making sure that our pitch indicator is towards the center. And there it is. Yeah, our pitch indicator is looking good. Um, within tolerance of our reaction wheels. Okay, uh, we need to go faster. So we're going to increase our thrust limiter to about... 19 we're gonna go to 20 there we go that should throw that gives us an extra 300 kilonewtons of thrust to play around with all right we are looking good um what we're gonna do now is we're going to lift our nose a bit above the horizon there we go and we're going to tilt ourselves tilt the nose at about 10 degrees there we go normally when the apple apps is behind you that's, and you want to push the Apple apps, and you want to pull the Apple apps toward your craft, you want to lift your nose above the horizon. That'll lift your thrust upwards. Now, if the Apple apps is, a, is ahead of you, and you want to bring the Apple apps toward your shuttle, well, you'll do the opposite. You'll lift your nose below the horizon. Oh, and speaking of which, the Apple apps just kind of overshot us. So we're going to tilt our nose again below the horizon. Okay, so pitch indicator looks good. Everything looks good. And look at that. We are at two kilometers already. We are almost there. So, um, we can technically turn off our main thruster as it is. Um, but we're just going to le let it burn because we have plenty of fuel here. We are doing amazing on fuel. Okay. And, and, let's take a look here. Um, our Apple Labs is getting away from us. Let's see if we can get this as close to 100 meters as possible. So we're going to go for Miko at 100 meter, 1,000, at 100 kilometers. And, okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I did not see, but <laughs> our nose just flipped end over end. Um, let's go ahead and restabilize our vehicle here. What we're going to do is we're going to shut down our main engine, and we're going to go specifically with our VTOL engine. So let's go ahead and tilt our VTOL engines accordingly. Oh, boy, and it's dark, too. Let's turn on the lights, um, whatever minimalist lights we have on this vehicle. Um, uh, speaking of minimalism, let's take a look at our part count. 38 parts. Look at that. Minus the SRBs, we have a 38-part count vehicle. Amazing for a minimalist design. Okay, so let's bring ourselves closer to 100 kilometers. And we're getting there, getting there, getting there. Okay, and we are at 100 kilometers, woo! Okay, look at that. Now we need to bring our Apple, our Perry apps to be the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to speed on over towards our Apple apps. And we're going to park ourselves almost right next to the Apple apps. Okay. And now what we are going to do is we're going to stabilize our orbit by getting our peri apps to be as close to um, 100 kilometers as possible as well. Um, around Kerbin, uh, space starts at 70 kilometers. In real life, I believe it starts at 100 kilometers. So interesting difference between those two. Okay, and we're at 95 kilometers. And, ooh, 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 let's scoot on toward the Apple Apps again. Mm -mm -mm. We're at 97 kilometers. We're almost there, guys. Okay, and let's go and tilt our shuttle. Now look at that electricity. Watch how fast it drains as a result of us using our inline reaction wheels. Okay, and you know technically we shouldn't be using our boost our uh, engine boosters to stabilize our orbit. <laughs> we should be ejecting our boosters now. 
um, and just using our RCS thrusters to do this. Uh, um, but since we have just so much fuel, okay, we're almost there. Let's let's go OCD on this, guys, and let's see if we can get it as close to uh, circling at 100 meters as at 100 kilometers as possible. There we go. Close enough. Woo! We are now in stable orbit, guys. Look at that. We just made history. Our very first space shuttle. <laughs> Our very first minimalist space shuttle. Um, in this save file, that is. Okay, so we're going to head on over to the day side here. So we're going to zip on through. Zip, 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 zip. There we go. And now... Um, we are going to add some space garbage. Yay, space garbage. And you know what, guys? I just realized we're using the wrong ailerons. <laughs> These are the wrong ailerons for this shuttle, but that's okay. Um, I guess they'll, they'll work anyways. Okay, here we go. And get ready. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to not only eject this tank... But we are also going to eject our engines. Now, why are we doing that? Okay, so these and this main engine, this Rocco Max engine, weighs six point, uh, weighs six point oh tons. So that's six tons there. These VTOL engines weigh about half a ton each. So total, we are looking at about seven to seven and a half tons if you count the girder and the decoupler worth of dead weight that this shuttle has. Um, and we really can't lug that around if the only thing we have to maneuver around in orbit here are our RCS thrusters. So we need to get rid of that. Ideally, we want to get rid of it in suborbital flight. That way it'll burn back into the atmosphere. However, we just use these guys to stabilize our orbit. So, um, yeah, we're going to leave it here in orbit uh, later on for some random other space vehicle to accidentally crash into. <laughs> okay. And so, releasing main fuel tank and engines in three, two, one, mark. Okay, and activating RCS thrusters, and we are going to jet away. Whoops, wrong direction. Jetting away from our assembly. Perfect. And look at that. We are moving majestically away from our main fuel tank and our engines. Belying the fact that the both of us are are maybe moving inches at a time um, with respect to each other, but in fact we both of us are moving at an amazing two and a quarter kilometers per second around carbon. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and speed up time now. And speed up time. And watch as our assembly gently moves away. Goodbye, guys. Thanks for bringing us into orbit. Okay, here we go. So now we're going to be a little bit more reliant on our RCS thrusters, especially to maneuver around. Um, part of the reason why we're using our RCS to uh, to turn our shuttle around more so than our reaction wheels is because, as you can see, our electricity drains like crazy. And if you're using something like um, the Thunder Aerospace um, life support mod, that requires you to have electricity in order to keep your Kerbals alive, that's something you want to be mindful of, right? Okay, there we are, and now we are in stable orbit. Go into the cockpit here. What do you think, guys? Woo, let's go and turn ourselves around here, and we can look down at, Ker at the Kerbin below. Yay, Kerbin. And I cannot see my house from here. <laughs> Okay, good deal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some regular maintenance checks. We're gonna open up our cargo bay and Bill, our resident space engineer, is gonna pop on out and he's going to check to see how our shuttle is doing. Woo, okay. So activate lights and right now everything looks good. Um, cargo bay looks good. We're gonna do a quick inspection around the shuttle area making sure everything looks good all right and the, we're going to check our heat tiles make sure everything is in its place and our heat tiles look good nothing is dislodged or come off the vehicle so we are still good 
And there's our radial thermal generator, which looks pretty spiffy. Okay, perfect. All right, Jeb, let's go and head on back into the shuttle. Let's look at that smile. Let's look at him. That is one easily amused Kerbinaut, guys. Okay, so let's go and head on in, and we're going to go right back into the cockpit. Ever so slowly, and back into the hatch you go. Okay, so now, um, now that we have completed our two orbit operations we are going to close our cargo bay turn off the lights and we're going to get ready for d orbit operations now we are almost fuel full on rcs fuel right remember what i said during the design of this shuttle that we have a commitment to get rid of as much rcs fuel as possible before we go back into kerbin or as we go back into kerbin so now we got to use our rcs a little bit liberally to make this work um Let's go ahead and have a look-see and figure out where we're going to land. Um, okay, so um, since Kerbin, since the Space Center isn't in the day side, we're going to try to hit for this main continent here. So let's go ahead and speed us around. Speed, speed, speed. Okay, and we're going to bring ourselves toward the night side in preparation for our RCSD orbit burn. Okay, as you can see, our part count is 22. What do you know, guys? We designed a space shuttle with the intent of designing it around 24 to 25 parts, and we managed to do it in just 22 parts. Guys, that is a minimalist shuttle. A functional minimalist shuttle, too. Okay, here we go. So we are on the other side. Now, if you guys are using liquid fuel boosters, your deorbit burn typically happens about a quarter of of the radius of the planet towards where you plan to land. So say you plan to land here on these little little dunes here in the desert, right? So you want to start your deorbit burn roughly about here when you're a quarter of the way there. However, the only thing we have is RCS thrusters. So it doesn't have the rapid change in velocity capability that regular liquid boosters have. Um, so we are going to do it while we're halfway around the planet. Okay. So here we go, guys. Time for our amazing RCS deorbit burn. So RCS on, and we are going to jet. Use up all that RCS fuel. Look at that go. <laughs> okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five RCS thrusters working. The RCS thrusters on the nose of the shuttle has a has a thrust capability of 0 0.5 kilonewtons. That's half of a kilonewton, guys. That is less thrust, believe it or not, less thrust than a, an ion thruster. The old ion thruster, um, you would have just as much thrust as the old ion thruster before the 23.5 update, but after the 23.5 update, this has about the quarter of the thrust of an ion thruster. Um, the ones on the wings, they have one um, kilonewton of thrust each. So total, we are deorbiting at um, at 4.5 kilonewtons of thrust, which is actually still pretty respectable. As you can see, our periaps is starting to dip. Okay, now when we dip our periaps um, and we plan to land anywhere, and if you plan to land, um, and you want to do, say, a pinpoint glide landing, roughly you want to set your periaps over the target, and your periaps would be about 38 kilometers, if I remember correctly. So bring it down to an altitude of 38 kilometers over the target you want to land. So if I want to land next to these dunes here, I need to bring this periaps down to about 38 kilometers. Um, but that's give and take, depending on the weight of your shuttle, as you return back into the atmosphere. Right now, we are still at 14 tons, as you can see here on the right-hand side. So we still got a ways to go. Okay, and we've got our periaps dipping ever so slowly. We're at 65 meters. Now, fortunately, our periaps is now below, um, right into the atmosphere of Kerbin. So we, this periaps is um, scheduled to be um, underneath, uh, um, to be back into the atmosphere, <laughs> away from space. 
Oh boy, I'm at a loss of for words today. Okay. Here we are, and we are at 58 kilometers, 57 kilometers. Woo! Oh boy, this is kind of the Kerbal Space Program version of watching paint dry, eh? And me stabbing my finger at on the end key. <laughs> watching our RCS fuel just drain away. Remember, we want to drain away as much RCS fuel as possible to not only make us lighter, but to make us more stable when we re-enter the atmosphere. Because right now, our center of mass is almost right on top of our um, center of lift. And that can spell trouble for us um, in terms of stability when we're trying to go back into the atmosphere. Okay, we're almost there. We're now at 44 kilometers. All we need to do is jet just a little bit more. Now, remember what I said when you want to bring your periaps closer toward you? You want to dip your nose below the horizon. So we can dip our nose below the horizon. However, that's not what we're looking for. We want our periaps to get away from us. Okay, ultimately, I'm thinking we're going to put our periaps somewhere near the ocean. Now what that does for us, uh, the reason being is because, well, Kerbin is turning below us. And so it's turning from west to east. And so by the time we start landing, uh, when we hit the atmosphere, we won't be hitting the atmosphere um, over ocean anymore. There will be land below us by the time we get there. And I think I just overthrusted a little bit. <laughs> oh, yep, I just did. We are at 31 kilometers on our periaps. But that is perfectly fine. We're going to leave it as that. This is a huge continent, so um, it leaves us plenty of margin for error. Okay, so here we go, you guys. Um, we're getting ready for our deorbit. Jeb, Bill, are you ready to go home? Look at those smiles. They are ready to go home. They haven't even completed a full orbit, and they're done with this. <laughs> and as our time indicator points, it has been 54 minutes. Um, according to them. So just 54 minutes in orbit and it's time to go home. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and, 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 and let's speed up time. Okay. And we're almost there. We're almost there. And 70 kilometers, we are now in the atmosphere. So what we're going to do is we're going to dip our nose down. And we're going to dip our nose down below the horizon at roughly about 45 degrees below the horizon. Why are we doing that? Well, um, orb um, based on orbital mechanics, what will happen is um, the shuttle um, will have... Uh, from our perspective, will look like it's lifting its nose above the horizon naturally as it orbits the planet. Um, so by the time we reach our point where we're going to um, start our landing procedures, their nose will have already lifted um, pretty darn close towards the horizon already. And you're going to see that as we speed up time. Okay, and... Um, oh boy. Um, we're going over ocean... All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to physical time warp. The dreaded physical time warp. I'll, I'll, I like to tell you guys that like when I deorbit stuff, I don't like to use physics time warp um, because it has a tendency to be a little wonky um, and screw things up for the game <laughs> and for my spacecraft. And not to mention, um, I like the relaxing moment of just watching um, my shuttles and my spacecraft um, second by second in real time come back into the atmosphere. But in the interest of time, we're going to use physical time warp. So cross your fingers, guys. Here we go. Okay. And two times, three times acceleration. Okay. And let's push it to four times acceleration. There we go. Now look, take a look at that ball there. You notice that our nose is starting to lift up naturally. That's orbital mechanics for you guys. Okay. And we should be hitting land any moment now. Or should be. We're at 50 kilometers altitude. 49, 48. We are almost there. There is the landmass, guys. 45 kilometers. Oh, and there's the camera. Okay, so the camera just pitched around, which just indicated to us that we are now in a suborbital trajectory. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to dip our nose just slightly. Let's check our periaps here. Our periaps is now at 17 kilometers, which is pretty respectable. That means if we, if we use a maneuver node, and we can use our maneuver node to check to see what our altitude is going to be when we hit our, the continent. So we're going to be at about 22 kilometers. So we're going to be good. So let's close that maneuver node. Um, and so we haven't hit our, our um, orbital, our shock heating effects yet. Shock heating usually occurs at about 28 kilometers. And also it depends on how shallow or how steep your descent is. Our descent is going to be a little bit shallow. So that means we're not going to see a whole bunch of shock heating. However, um, places where you're going to see a ton of shock heating are, say, if you were orbiting the moon and you were just doing a direct from moon to Kerbin orbit and you were just falling straight into the atmosphere. However, we're just doing a gentle descent from orbit back down into the atmosphere. So we're not going to see a whole ton of shock heating here because we're doing effectively just a gentle glide back down into the atmosphere here. Okay, and let's go ahead and um, do another physics time warp here and bring us back down into the planet. Okay, so we are almost there. Okay, and we should be hitting shock heating in just a few moments here. And we are at 29 kilometers. There's our shock heating, guys, right on schedule. Okay, hold on to your pants, Jeb and Bill. We're going to be slowing down in a hurry. Okay, here we go. So we are at 26 kilometers. And what we're going to do is we're going to activate our lights here. We're going to need our lights when we start to, when we come back down and start landing. So um, we are at 23 kilometers, 22 kilometers. I'm going to use my RCS thrusters here to stabilize us. That way we use up more RCS fuel as we come back down. Okay. Remember, the more RCS fuel we use, the more stable the shuttle is going to be. We don't want to come back to Kerbin with a ton of RCS fuel. Remember, RCS fuel is in the back here of our shuttle, so we don't want to be butt heavy. <laughs> we want to have a nice trim butt when we come back into uh, Kerbin. That way, it's safer for all of us. It's safer for Jeb and Bill here when we come back in. Okay, here we go, and we are at 14 kilometers. Let's go take a look at our map here. Looks like we're going to be landing somewhere in the plains. Perfect. Okay, and we're going to dip our nose down so that we can lose altitude a little bit quicker this way. Okay, and we're almost there, guys. We are almost home. Oh, Jeb and Bill, looking forward to eating those snacks, eh? Okay, and we are at 7.5 kilometers, 7 kilometers. Um, let's see, I, unfortunately, there is no efficient way to check to see what your radar altitude is. Um, that um, altitude, of course, is um, based on sea level altitude, but this land is not sea level, <laughs> of course. So we can go into the cockpit and we can take a look at our radar altitude. Um, but that radar altitude doesn't register until you're 2,500 meters above the surface. So, Okay, so we are almost there. Now is about the time to start activating our landing gears. So landing gears, brakes, and let's go ahead and turn on our lights. And let's prep for landing. What we're going to do is we're going to do a hasty landing here. We're going to come crashing back into the atmosphere and land as quickly as we can. This gives us a couple advantages. For one, it allows us to land faster. And number two, it helps prevent us from stalling, because we're, um, which is important because these wings, these delta wings are fairly stubby, um, and they don't provide a whole lot of lift, which means that this shuttle will have a tendency to stall if you're not careful. So that's something we need to watch out for. Okay. So in order to prevent stalling with this, per, with this specific shuttle design, you want to be able to roughly keep it at around 40 meters per second. Okay. Um, looks like, oh, our light is already catching the ground. Uh, we don't see any shadow yet. So 
However, oh, there's our there's our shadow. Okay, so as we land, we want to aim to make sure that our vertical velocity is at five meters per second or less. We don't want to hit at 10 meters per second, which is where we're at right now. So let's drop ourselves down with a vertical velocity of about five meters per second. So we're going to flare at the last second here, guys. Here we go. Nice and steady. Hold on to your pants, Jeb and Bill. It's going to be a bit of a rough one. <laughs> Here we go, and three, two, one, zero, and we're on the ground, woo! Okay, turn off SAS, and we will back thrust with our RCS. Brakes are on. Let's stop as quickly as we can before we accidentally fumble ourselves over a hill or something. 10 meters per second, nine meters, eight meters, six, five, four, three, two, and one! Ladies and gentlemen, we have successfully landed, and this completes our test of our Mark I space shuttle, minimalist space shuttle, at an amazing 22 parts. We landed with about 13.73 tons left on our butt here, worth of RCS fuel and the rest of our components. So let's go ahead and recover and head back into the hangar. Okay, so that, in a nutshell, guys, is how you build a traditional minimalist space shuttle using, tradi um, using a traditional shuttle launch design. Um, I hope that this little live cast was uh, informative to you, and I wish you guys the best of luck in designing your very own minimalist space shuttle. And once you do, go ahead and post on uh, post a video. I'd love to see what your minimalist space shuttles look like, um, and how you guys um, uh, launch your shuttles traditional style as well. Um, in the meantime, you guys have a great day, and I hope to see you guys again. I consider this mission accomplished, and have a good day. Once again, bye-bye, guys.